I saw God this week in an email. I was just talking with my neighbor about how the youth are being left out of the church conversation. And I received an email from Restoration Church saying that the youth are going to start meeting on Wednesdays and Thursdays safely. I was excited and I know God is in it. This week I've been seeing God in the faces of people who are suffering and impoverished in the truth of the lives of people who have been oppressed, who are living with the reality of racism day in and day out, in the lives of people who have to deal with who the truth of their lives is one of violence. They're terrified of what's gonna happen to them. And so God's just reminding me as we head into tomorrow, the day that we're going to celebrate the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a reverend, a pastor, a man who talked about these three evils, the evils of racism and of, of violence and of poverty, a guy who, who prayed, but also who used his voice, who used his influence that we are supposed to be people too who pray, who pray for an end to racism and hatred and violence, but also that we're called to be people who are change makers, who speak up against oppression and injustice and racism and hatred and who are change makers who use our own influence the voices that we have the resources that god has given us to change the world around us a few days ago we were out for a drive and i was feeling a little overwhelmed by all the things that were going on in our country and in our world and all of a sudden i felt this prompting to um, talk about gratitude. And so I, I just asked Floyd, I said, okay, let's name three things that we are each grateful for. And the first thing I said was, oh no, she wants me to start talking. And then I, then I thought about all the negative stuff that's happening in our own lives and in the world. And then was able to um, bring it back to what has God provided for us and what have we've done. And so we each shared the sh shared three things, and I immediately just kind of felt this calm come over me, and I felt like there was just something really powerful in saying it out loud and sharing it with somebody else. And so um, it just helped us to refocus uh, where we were and just that we do have much to be grateful for. Well, hi everyone. Happy New Year. It is, it's good to be with you. And I think a lot of us, we've spent this time headed into the New Year kind of looking back. And we've been imagining, you know, all these things that could have been in 2020. And we've been thinking about lost expectations and, and maybe some lost hopes and dreams. And I've been wondering if we are headed into 2021 kind of a little bit like my sisters and I, when we used to go shopping with my mom. So I don't, I don't know if you grew up with a mom like my mom, but when my mom would take all my sisters, she would like give us this speech before we went shopping. And she'd, she'd say, all right, don't look at anything, don't touch anything, because you are not getting anything. <laughs> and I wonder if we're headed into 2021 a little bit like that. You know, with our heads down, we, we, we don't want to say much, we don't want to do much. We don't want to disturb anything because we all want to get out of this thing in one piece. But the truth is, as God's people, we are made for so much more than that. We're not made to be a people who walk around with our heads down. We're not made to be a people who are, who are just surviving, who are just getting by. See, God's created us for something so much more. And God's inviting us into what God is doing, this grand plan of restoration. And it's a plan for you, it's a plan for me, it's a plan for our church, for our communities, our schools, our neighborhoods, for our country. It's a plan for our whole world. God's plan is to restore all things. And when we look at scripture, the entire arc of scripture, what we see is God talking about this new thing. From the very beginning, God speaks through the prophet Isaiah. I am doing a new thing. Do you see it? Do you see what I'm doing? All the way to the end, that very last book, the book of Revelation, God says, behold, I make all things new. And God's plan of restoration is a new thing. See, God loves to take broken, beat up, ugly things 
and make them new again. And so for the next four weeks, what we're gonna do is we're gonna gather together and we're gonna unpack, we're gonna look at what restoration is. God's plan to restore and redeem and renew and fix and to make all things new. We're gonna look at God's plan of restoration for you and your life, God's plan of restoration when, when you've messed up, when you're disappointed in yourself. God's plan of restoration when, when someone's hurt you. And God has a plan of restoration for the oppressed, for our country and for our culture. And today I'm excited because we're gonna to talk to Brendan and we're gonna hear from him and he's gonna to explain to us how God's plan of restoration is a plan that we see all throughout scripture. And it's God's plan to make everything, to make all things new. So today, before we worship, let, let's take a moment. I don't know where you're coming in from. Maybe you're sitting at home, maybe you're in your car, but let's just refocus ourselves. Kind of take a deep breath. And let's come before God. Let's focus our hearts and focus our minds and ask God to, to realign our vision as we focus and, and we worship our King. So let's come before God together in prayer. Father, God, you are a God who sees and knows all things. You are a God who exists in the past, who walked with us all throughout 2020, God, through all the valleys and, and all the hills. You, you stand with us right here today, God, so present, so aware. God, you are around us. You are in all things and through all things, and you are in us. And God, we stand on the promise that you are in our future too, that you are preparing a plan and a path and a way for us as you call us forward. And God, when we look at the world around us right now, when we look at the brokenness inside of us, in our families and in our culture and in our country, God, we cry out. We cry out for restoration. We cry out for this new thing, for you to come and to fix this, to redeem it, to make it new. And God, we know that you are the one who will do that work. And God, we come today and we boldly ask with humble hearts that you will use us in the work that you are doing. We are submitted, we are willing, we are open, and we are humble. God, speak to your people today. They have gathered and we are listening. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. 
that we were made for. Oh, you're worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Oh, you're worthy of every breath. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, oh, You're worthy of every breath that we could ever breathe. We live for You. Oh, we live for You. Holy, there is no one like. There is none beside you Open up my eyes in wonder And show me who you are And fill me with your heart And lead me in your love to those around me song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring You are so worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for You Oh, we live for You oh. Jesus, the name above every other could ever save, ever save us. You're worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. You're holy. Holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my Open up my eyes in 
wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Stillness, I know that you are God. In the secret of your presence, I know there I am restored. When you call, I won't refuse. Crucified to set me free. 
There is no one else for me Not but Jesus Crucified to save
Hey, what's up, Restoration? My name is Brendan, and I am so glad that you chose to join us today for this worship experience. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna have these times where we gather together to worship, to pray, and to explore what scripture has to teach us about restoration. And you're gonna hear others talk about individuals who experience restoration in scripture. But today, what I wanna do is actually take a big picture look at this, to take a macro level look and see what all of scripture has to say about restoration. But before we get into that, I actually want to give you a moment to reflect on what restoration means to you. When you think about that word restoration, what images or pictures come to mind? If you're comfortable, actually go ahead and just put that in the chat right now. What pictures do you think of when you think of restoration? You know, when I think about restoration, one of the first things that comes to mind are these old woodworking projects I used to do as a kid. My mom would come home every summer with all these old pieces of furniture that she wanted us to restore as projects for the local county fair. And I would spend hours and hours and hours and hours just stripping the paint off this furniture and staining this furniture and sanding it down and sealing it. And as a kid, I didn't really mind doing all this hard work because I knew that if I did a good enough job, well, I'd get a blue ribbon at the county fair and that would be worth $3. If you get enough blue ribbons, that's a lot of money as a 10 year old. Now as an adult, I look back and I think, wow, my mom just used me as really cheap child labor. But still, what I loved about these projects, looking back, is that my mom and I worked together to take these pieces of furniture that were probably considered junk to other people, that probably just sat in someone's basement for years, and we restored it so that it could have a new purpose in our home. And I think that's helpful as we think about what we want to be about as a restoration church. Not that we want to be a place that hires kids for cheap labor, but that we want to be a place where restoration happens, where purpose is realized anew. And the reason we want that is because that's what God seems to be about in Scripture. You see, the story of Scripture is really a story about the restoration of all things. 
It's a grand narrative about how God takes things that have begun to waste away and how he breathes new life in them, how he revitalizes them and gives them purpose in his new world. I mean, just think about how scripture begins. It begins in Genesis 1 with God creating a world that scripture tells us is good. Over and over and over again, seven times in fact, that passage Genesis 1 tells us that what God made, he saw as good. That number seven being a number that symbolizes perfection. Genesis 1 goes on to tell us that God also created humans to bear his image. An ancient Near Eastern way of saying that they were like flesh and blood statues who were, his, who were made to be his representatives, who were made to be like stewards of God's good creation. Now, unfortunately, as we continue reading in scripture, what we discover is that those image bearers failed in their calling. They didn't represent God. They looked more like broken statues than flesh and blood statues. And as a consequence, that good creation that they were made to steward actually began to waste away with them. And so in Genesis 12, God got involved in the story. He appointed a family, and then a nation, and then finally a person, Jesus, to be conduits of restoration to this dying world. And we see this especially in the Gospels, where we see Jesus healing the sick, where he welcomes outcast, where he forgives criminals, and especially where he rises from the dead. The decisive moment in the story where the power of death is undone and the future restoration of all things is guaranteed. And that future restoration of all is what we read about at the end of the Bible. In the closing pages of scripture, what we discover is that all those things that God had created to be good, but that had since begun to waste away, are restored anew. We are resurrected to life with new bodies, and we are made to be stewards again of a creation that mirrors God's original creation, the Garden of Eden. That's the story of scripture, the story of the restoration of all things. Now, unfortunately, that's not always the story that is told. I think too often in the American church, we've described scripture not as a story of restoration, but actually as a story of escape, a story about how after we die, we're carried away from this world forever to live some spiritual existence in the clouds. You know, there's this old hymn that says, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. What we can't miss is that scripture isn't a story that ends with us going to heaven. It's actually a story that ends with heaven coming to earth and all things being restored. At the end of the Bible, heaven comes here. This is our home. And I think that's important for a lot of reasons. One being that it means that our lives have purpose in the here and now. And we're not just twiddling our thumbs, waiting till the day we can be carried away to a better place. When we become members of the family of God, we're invited to the task of partnering with him again. God gives us a new purpose. He invites us into his restoration project. Paul writes about this in Romans 8, 29, and 30, where he says, We know that in everything God works for good with those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Those he foreknew, you see, he also marked out in advance to be shaped according to the model of the image of his son. What Paul is saying here is that God is restoring us to the image of Christ so that we can join with him in that work of restoration, so that we can work for good with him. Not just God working for good by himself, but us working for good with God, joining him in that restoration project. That means that the things we do in our lives right now matter. That the simple acts of charity that the warm acts of hospitality, they all build into God's master plan. I love the way N.T. Wright describes this in Surprised by Hope. He says, what you do in the Lord is not in vain. You're not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to fall over a cliff. You are not restoring a great painting that's shortly going to be thrown into a fire. You're not planting roses in a garden that's about to be dug up for a building site. You are strange, though it may seem, almost as hard to believe as the resurrection itself, accomplishing something which will become, in due course, part of God's new world. 
And this is what excites me so much about a Restoration Church. The idea of being part of a community that is drawn to action because it understands the actions we take today actually contribute to God's new world. You see, we don't want this to be a place where you can have a passive faith experience, where you can walk in, have a cup of coffee, worship, and then leave. Our hope, our vision, is that this will be a community that is engaged, a community that calls out the best in people, that helps people discover their purpose, that challenges all of us to get involved into the important work of restoration that God is doing everywhere. Because God could do all this work by himself, but his preferred method has always been to work with people like you and like me. And so if that's a church that you want to be a part of, then I encourage you to continue joining us as we discover together what it might look like for all of us to use our gifts as part of the grand story of restoration. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for who you are, that you are a God who sees us, who knows us, who loves us, who hasn't given up on us, but a God who is always working for us, a God who's working the best for us because you want to work with us. And so God, would you continue to inspire us? Would you continue to challenge us? And would you use us, God, as a church community to do your will in this world? God, we love you. We thank you. This we pray in your name. Amen.